Hello, in my previous video I introduced Inform 7 by coding a very simple scenario with a handful of very sparse rooms and a handful of props. This is a more fleshed out example. It's taken on that generic your office setting and developed it into a, a role playing scenario where your avatar is an intern at a local newspaper. So, uh, Gazette Newsroom exits lead north to the editor's office and east to the lobby. On your desk are your press badge, your digital voice recorder, your camera, and your lunch. Take badge. Taken. While wearing your press badge, you'll be clearly identified as a reporter for the Greenstown Gazette. Okay, well, I better wear badge. I want to have a voice recorder. Okay, students might not know what a voice recorder is. Uh, so if we switch the recorder on, we get a little message uh, that hints that when you interview a source, you better use your voice recorder. Okay, students uh, often want to just default to using their phones for everything, and so I'm commenting here about how a, a standalone camera, the benefits of learning how to use a standalone camera, and, uh, and bizarrely enough, uh, there's even a little uh, message about the payola ethics problems in lunches, make sure that, uh, you know, a student reporter knows not to accept a free lunch and to report it, to check with your editor for anything that could possibly be determined a bribe. Okay, so from here we go north into the editor's office. The editor interacts with us, with us a little bit. Um, I'm going to take the book and uh, we go, he gives us the next quest, a little color commentary about in, being an intern, uh, ready to cover City Hall, something about power lines, I'll have Lucas print out the statement from Valley Power, get it on your way out, so let's go, uh, go south first. Uh, the instructions there is telling me, ah, east to the lobby, go east. Okay, well there's Lucas and there's my printout, so how about I take printout? Uh, I should look at it. Okay, it's a PR statement. Um, I've got the printout, and so how about I go south now? Here I am in Main Street. Here in Main Street, there's a flyer. And uh, we have, you know, at least uh, a student who's at least done the bare minimum of getting two different sides of the story will have the PR statement from the uh, company and might be able to go talk to the protesters. I think some... Uh, well, the point of this scenario would be introduced that, uh, you know, uh, simply relying on what's in the flyer and relying on what's in the PR statement uh, is very weak journalism. The student actually needs to go talk to the protesters, and then maybe there'll be the possibility later on in this game for the student to actually speak to the um, uh, Valley Power. They might not be able to talk to the CEO, but they might be able to get a company spokesperson to flesh out their story. So now I shall walk you through how I coded the scenario up to this point, and we will focus on a network of locations to explore, some props to manipulate, and some very simple NPCs to interact with. So any game needs to start with a location. When we run it, Oh boy, uh, now that I've announced it's the Gazette Newsroom, boy, isn't it an engaging journalism educational scenario? Let's at least, you know, and if you type, you know, nothing, that's the general default reaction. So let's at least personalize that and give this game, you know, some little gesture towards personalization. Okay, and I'm going to add some locations, and I'm copying and pasting because I find if I type, I make so many typos and it slows my presentation down. But when we run this very simple game, uh, well, let me take you to go over to index and world. What we see here is this is, a, you know, really a beautiful part of the inform development uh, environment. Here we have the Gazette Newsroom, GN little icon uh, represent, representing the location. It tells us that the me, the character is here, it's bold, 
Uh, I've identified the Gazette lobby that's off to the right, so that's the east, and the uh, Gruff's office is to the north. And so um, uh, at the moment, because we only have, you know, four lines of code, this might seem unnecessary, but when a project gets really, really big, it's really useful having this kind of automatic updated uh, outline that kind of walks you through a, 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 an increasingly complex scenario. Now, a problem that um, sometimes my students uh, run into is, now you and I know from seeing this map and from seeing this code, we know that when we start the game, that when we go north, we will go into Gruff's office and that we go south back into the newsroom and we go to the lobby out to the east. Now, you and I know that because we saw the map. The uh, player won't have access to this map. It, it, interactive fiction dates from a time where uh, players did not expect the game to have the sort of graphical power to do auto mapping. So part of playing a text adventure game in the in, in the 70s, 80s, and even early 90s, uh, the pleasure of playing the game was creating the map and keeping track of it. But right, let's make it a little bit easier for our players by... Um, I'm just going to... Here, we all need one definition of the newsroom. Uh, so I've added just some very, very simple very basic instructions that at least now uh, in the starter situation, it tells me uh, the directions that I can go to. So, you know, go back up north and uh, south. It, 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 it's much easier to um, have that stuff. Now, notice here, here we are in the lobby. It says exits lead west, east into the business room and Main Street is south. Well, if I type east here, it says you can't go that way, you can't go that way. Again, I hit north, it, I can't go that way. So I've announced in this text, inside direct quotation marks, rooms and details that I have not implemented as computer instructions, which I would need to do in order to uh, actually allow the player to go to these locations. So even though I've mentioned that there is a business wing to the east, uh, we can't go there. And if you look on the index map, uh, the business wing doesn't exist in this map because it's only mentioned in this direct quoted text. And the compiler that creates the code for the computer completely ignores what's happening inside these quotation marks. This is eye candy for, you know, the meat popsicle who's playing your game. Uh, we actually need to uh, announce to the computer using this very, you know, English language-like uh, uh, programming statements. This is how I create uh, the business office, which is west of this Gazette lobby. And I'm leaving it uh, kind of uncommented here for a moment. I'll, I'll explain why towards the ending of the video. So here we are in the business office now. We go to the index, and now we've created a business office. So let's follow that same pattern. I'm going to, uh, here in the quoted text, we have a reference to Main Street. Now I'm actually going to code the fact that Main Street is south of the Gazette lobby, and I'm going to add a description of Main Street. So if we run this again, let's go to the story. I'm trapped in the business office. Go back west, south. I am now outside on Main Street. And again, it leads east towards City Hall, which I haven't imp implemented. But you get the idea how that works. So uh, we have a, the beginnings. This is a very, very basic way of creating a network of rooms with separate descriptions. And uh, it's a little dry right now because there's not a whole lot to do. I mean, there's nothing really in these rooms other than the fact that you're listing exits. So let's move from this very, very basic, sketchy uh, uh, landscape uh, setting discussion. Let's talk about objects kind of like a still life. Uh, in the, the Gazette newsroom, we're going to say, I'm going to go back up here. Oh, um, yeah, I just want to show this here in the index. Uh, this is starting at a little complex. I want to go to the newsroom. That pops me right up here. Here's where I've mentioned the newsroom. And then I'm going to paste 
uh, I'm going to create a desk. I'm going to say on my desk, I'm going to put some objects on the desk. And I'm going to describe these objects. Well, I'll describe in a minute. Let's just run this. We'll see what happens now. Okay, so we now have a desk. I can, I can take the badge. I can take the lunch. I can go north. I can drop what I'm carrying. Now when I look, uh, the press badge and the lunch, I've deposited them on the floor of Gruff's, Gruff's office. I don't know, maybe because I'm quitting and I'm leaving and I'm going to, you know, write poetry instead of journalism. Um, okay, so uh, uh, it's still, a, you know, a little dry. There's not a whole lot going on. If I, how about I go back? Okay, I'll apologize. I'll take my badge. Uh, apologize to the non-existent editor who I haven't created yet. If I examine the badge, there's nothing... You know, there's nothing going on here. Uh, go south. There's no. Uh, I haven't told Inform Seven anything interesting about any of these objects. So uh, this uh, scenario is supposed to be an educational scenario. So how about I add, you know, just a little bit of, you know, uh, factual tidbits that kind of jam some, you know, expositional. Uh, good for you to know details down people's throats as they play the game. There we go. Um, uh, now, uh, the description here that I added makes the badge, you know, it's more vague than just, um, uh, you know, a, a bland generic thing. But I mentioned wearing your press badge. And I think it would be reasonable for uh, a player to want to wear the badge. Um, Inform 7 is smart enough to know you have to take something before you wear it. I mean, the concept of wearing is built into Inform 7, but I haven't yet told Inform 7 that a badge is a wearable thing. I'm going to click this recycle button, button and that will add, or it'll rerun all the commands I've just typed. So previously it said you can't wear that. Now it knows a press badge is something that's wearable. Let's do something else that's perfectly reasonable to do. Okay, uh, Inform 7 understands the concept of edible things, but I haven't told Inform 7 that your lunch is an edible thing. So let's run these commands again. And now things are working, you know, more or less normally. Now, wouldn't it be nice if I could type something like this? Now, you and I completely understand what that sentence means. Uh, it, it, it fits perfectly naturally in, you know, all these other sentence-like codes. But this is going to cause an error message. Inform 7 doesn't understand the concept of preventing the player from leaving the newsroom. I mean, it's possible to code a way to prevent the player from leaving the newsroom, but you can't just imagine, well, how would I say it in English, and then type it out and expect Inform 7 to understand you. Uh, I just noticed some students get confused by this. Now, Inform 7... Uh, uh, it's designed to be easy to read, but it's still just as persnickety as any other programming language to write. So just because you and I understand a sentence doesn't mean that Inform 7 will. Now, Inform 7 is actually very good at understanding basic concepts of containment and visibility and touchability. So if I wanted to, I don't know, model Sleeping Beauty's glass coffin, let me get rid of this error message. I'll paste in this code. The glass coffin is an openable, open, locked, transparent container in the Gazette newsroom. Sleeping Beauty is a woman in the glass coffin. Okay. Well, when I run that, not only does Inform 7 accept that, but I can also...
Okay, remember I said it's lockable? All right, so um, it might look like magic that, you know, that, oh, I'm just going to make a glass coffin that's openable, open, locked, transparent, and contains a, a woman. Well, you know, even if I even run this, I can even... Uh, Um, Inform 7 understands concepts such as openability and even understands there on a very, very basic level, the concept of kissing. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, the default world doesn't make any sense to model the social context of kissing other than assuming by default a kiss is probably not appropriate for every uh, uh, interaction with an NPC. So, um, so I chose this example of Sleeping Beauty's open, transparent, locked uh, or lockable um, container because I knew that Inform 7 understood all those concepts. So um, uh, there is actually, uh, let me get rid of Sleeping Beauty in her coffin, there is actually a way that I can code this environment so that uh, it won't let me move unless I am carrying that press badge. So let me run that. And now when I try leaving the newsroom, and I'm not carrying the press badge, instead of moving me north, which you would expect, the game gives me this message, but you're not fully equipped, and it, and I'm not in the editor's room. So, however, uh, you know, I can certainly take the badge, and now there I am in Gruff's office. So, uh, now a problem with this, however, is, well, let me... I'll go back down. Uh, I'll go back south. Okay. Now, um, remember when you examine the badge earlier, uh, I referenced this wearing the press badge. Well, let me be a good intern and wear the badge. And now when I try to leave, it says you're not fully equipped. Now, the reason for that, and it's kind of a little puzzling, but Inform 7 understands carrying something as different from the concept of wearing something. So this query here, uh, when the player does not carry the press badge, if I'm wearing it, Inform 7 doesn't consider that I'm carrying it. There is actually a, uh, an alternative concept of if a character encloses something, that's true whether you are wearing it or whether you are um, just carrying it in your inventory. So when I run this again, now uh, here I am wearing my press badge, I go north, and it still allows me to uh, come and go whether I'm wearing the press badge uh, or not. So uh, um, We've created some basic rooms to organize the experience, and we've created just a few props. And uh, you know, we briefly created Sleeping Beauty, but she was kind of boring. Let's create uh, an, an NPC, a very simple NPC, who at least sort of, you know, fits in with this scenario. So I'm going to go back to my index, and just so I don't get lost, I'm going to go to Gruff's office. There we are. That's where I first mentioned Gruff's office. And in Gruff's office, I'm going to add... Nate Gruff. And let's run that. Now remember, if I just go north, I can't do that anymore. I have to take the badge. Now I can go north, and there's Editor Gruff. Okay, he's completely boring. Let's show badge. Okay, nothing. He's got nothing to do. He's just a plain vanilla uh, NPC. Um, let's give him uh, a little bit of, you know, personality here. So, uh, th this quoted text right here, this, when I say the description of your press badge, that is only... Uh, printed when you type examine. So if I type examine, X is short for examine, 
Examine Badge, it prints that out. I am, instead of adding the description of the press badge, I'm going to add this sentence, which will print out automatically anytime I'm in the presence of Nate Gruff, whether I type examine Gruff or not. Uh, and in order to avoid the uh, you know boring repetition of uh, the, d the default descriptions of how characters react when you try to interact with them. I'm going to give like this personal baseline. Um, anytime you do something with Gruff that I haven't coded a special activity for, at least he will say something that's in character. And I'm providing an in-world explanation. Let me take my badge. I'm providing an in-world explanation for why Gruff is not all that communicative. He's busy. So if I examine him, you know, there's nothing special about him. Okay, this is, you know, an editor with a face for radio. Ha ha, very funny. Uh, uh, he's still very passive and boring. Uh, I'm going to do just a little bit of something that will save this little joke that he has a face for radio. I'm going to save it and deliver it to the player as a reward for them having asked for more information about Gruff, rather than kind of spilling all my beans and saying everything that I have to say about a Gruff at first, because if you look at it, you know, if I go back south, north, it still just keeps over and over again, keeps saying Nate Gruff, the Gazette's distinguished editor with a face for radio, it was hard to work. It gets boring after a while. So I am instead of giving all that away at once, I'm going to have a much, you know, blander initial description. We'll get that joke out of here and we'll just simply say he's hard at work. I'm going to give a specific description of Gruff. It says that. And because people are might very likely uh, refer to, they might forget his name and call him editor, let's add some synonyms. Synonyms are good here. Yeah, earlier, um, my press badge. I actually almost typed this. Um, if I misspeak and accidentally call it a press pass instead of a press badge, uh, we'll um, I'll allow that to accept that. Synonyms are good. Okay, so there we go. The pass works. Synonym works. Um, and now all uh, uh, when I see Gruff for the first time, it just says he's hard at work. Examine Gruff, he has a face for radio. Boom, crash. Okay. If you put a little setup in this text, which is printed out automatically when you walk into a room in the presence of an object, and then put a little punchline or put a little joke rather in, yeah, punchline in uh, the description text, you get a setup and a punchline rhythm that makes even a silly joke like uh, uh, has a face for radio, uh, feel like, you know, a more customized joke because it's delivering the joke to reward somebody who has expressed even a little bit of interest in, um, in this character. Now, uh, I want my students to understand that part of what editors do is send reporters out to cover stories. So I'm going to, um, I also want students to understand that the Associated Press style book is a big part of professional journalism. So I'm going to have a little tiny, you know, like a little tiny mini quest here, and I'm going to just add the spacing here. I'm going to change this description of Gruff a little bit. So I'm going to add a little bit here to make this a little bit more personalized. Instead of just saying he's hard at work, how about we have him greet the player? Okay, so now we go north. Uh, he calls you your favorite intern, and he mentions that he's going to give you something. So uh, let's now create the object for him to give you. It's your new copy of the Associated Press style book. So let's run that and see what we get. Okay. Well, that's nice. So I take the book. Lovely. Okay, good. Now, if I were to leave at this point, 
and come, uh, how about I go south, and I come back again, there's going to be a problem. I've already taken the book, but Nate is still telling me he's got a present for you. What, I got another present? There's no other present here. So I really only want this bit about my favorite intern to happen once. And Inform 7 has a, a really efficient way of identifying text in uh, a, here we go, of identifying text like this, so that I'm going to say the first time only, okay, we kind of turn on this condition with first time, he's going to say this stuff. And in here, paragraph break, I'm simply adding a line break so that it's a little bit more visible. I guess I'll show you what it looks like without the paragraph break. Then you'll see why I added the paragraph break. So let's run this. Again, take badge. North. There he is. If I... How about I just look again? The second time... See this? I see my favorite intern. That only happens once. But because it's kind of jammed up in here, it looks weird. Anyway, that's the reason why I started this off with... Just to make that more legible, I find uh, uh, in a text adventure game, sometimes people will skim and they'll only read the, the starting parts of paragraphs. So I never put anything important at the end of a paragraph. I try to put it at the beginning of the paragraph. So same thing happens. All we do is Nate's line has been moved from here down to here. And when we look at uh, in the room, uh, a little bit of time passes. You can also just wait, hit the Z for wait, time passes, look, whatever. Fun commands in Inform Seven. You can you can undo a command if that's useful. So um, we've uh, added a new prop, and we've given a situation where Gruff gives us one directive once. We're taking the book in this version. No, how about I take the book? Uh, book, take the book. The book is no longer there. So. Um, that's nice. Uh, I think, however, I would like to have Gruff acknowledge your action and then kind of give you your next quest. And Inform 7 comes with the concept of being able to do things after certain actions happen. We've identified the style book as an object in this world. Inform 7 already understands the concept of taking. So uh, the hooks are there. The Inform 7 understands me if I do this. After taking the style book, say, and I kind of have uh, uh, Gruff give you... Griff? Gruff? Uh, I have uh, Gruff give you the next quest. So let's run this and see how this looks. Okay. Uh, we get a little bit of affirmation in the game world. The gruff editor is nodding at us. Uh, um, and uh, he says, get a printout from uh, uh, Lucas on your way out. So, um, edit, well, you know, there is nobody that we meet on the way out. So I guess the next thing that I need to do is uh, add the character Lucas. But Here's a little problem that I haven't accounted for yet. I'm out here on Main Street. If I happen to drop the book and take a book again, suddenly Griff is watching me. Uh, uh, you know, I I look around. Griff Griff is not here. He's still in his office. Inform Seven is not is not smart enough to know that a character that I mention in the quoted text uh, is not there in the room with me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that this after it's taking the style book happens only. So it is only once after I take the style book, first the badge, take the book, drop the book. Okay. Now, when I take the book a second time, we don't get Gruff's... Uh, uh, avuncular affirmations. Okay, so in the dialogue, we mentioned a printout and we mentioned Lucas. Uh, I'm going to start by creating the printout. 
and I'm going to keep it right here. I'm going to do it right here, right after uh, Gruff mentions the printout for the first time. But because um, I don't want the printout to be interactable anywhere in the game until the player has taken the book and read this dialogue. So I'm going to start up by saying a printout is nowhere, and we'll see how Inform handles that. Go back to index. There's now a, uh, a new list down here, nowhere. All these other items are grouped by location. There's now a new item that indicates that the printout doesn't exist anywhere in the game world. Okay, so I am now going to make it so that... Um, in addition to giving us this affirmation when the style book is taken for the first time, I'm going to do two things. I am also going to, uh, in the same command, I'm going to move the style book, I'm sorry, I'm going to move the printout from its an initial nowhere loca location to, uh, to the uh, lobby where you, the player, can access it. And uh, up to now, I've typed commands that really only do one thing at a time. Here, after taking the stop for the first time, instead of just printing something, I am going to do this. I'm going to change the comma to a colon. I'm going to hit enter and tab. And now I'm going to add a semicolon. And now I'm ready to do something else so that the colon tells Inform 7 I'm going to give you a list of stuff to do. That's the first statement, and now that you've done that first statement, here's the next thing I want you to do. And then a period says, okay, I'm done with all the statements. And that colon, that tab, the semicolon, and the period are incredibly important. If you do a lot of coding in Inform 7, you will spend a lot of time uh, tracking down missing semicolons and dealing with spacings and colons and stuff like that. So um, that's just a little happy warning there. So I'm running that game again. And now uh, we've taken the book. I'll have Lucas print out the statement from Valley Power. If we go back to the index, the starting, this index only shows the starting environment of the game world. The game started with the printout nowhere. But now that the story is running, we've run this command that says uh, uh, we've taken the style book for the first time. I'm now going to go south and east, and there's a printout. Okay, and the printout contains a PRE kind of market ease statement. All right, so, uh, but if I run this game first, let's take that badge. And now if I don't visit the editor, and I go out in the lobby, the printout is nowhere to be found, okay? Uh, the printout is still in the pseudo-location nowhere. Okay, so, um, all right, the lobby is empty. I've mentioned Lucas, but right now Lucas doesn't exist. I'm going to the index. I'm going to go to the Gazette lobby. There's where I introduce the Gazette lobby. I'm going to put all the stuff in the Gazette lobby here, and the first thing that I'm going to put in the Gazette lobby is Lucas go. I run that. And here we are. Lucas is at the reception desk. Remember when we first uh, created uh, the editor Gruff? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. All right. Wave at. There we go. How about this? All right. Lucas is pretty boring right now. Instead of just you see nothing special about Lucas and there is no reply, let's at least uh, give a let's give Lucas a little bit of personality here, so that instead of him being completely plain vanilla and bland, let's give him an in-world reason for why he doesn't have a whole lot to do with the player. So. Um, no. How about this? There we go. That triggers conversation. Um,
that wave at Lucas didn't work. I can do this. I can, you know, just because it's bothering me. Uh, there we go. Wave at. Um, inform understands the concept of wave badge like wave wand but if i wanted to wave at uh gruff it previously would have ignored it now at least it recognizes it as a believable action all right so there we go that's that's something anyhow um now uh uh when we get back out to the lobby okay lucas again he's pretty boring he just sits there so um let's give lucas more than just sitting at the reception desk, let's at least, let's remember that first time only structure. The first time we see Lucas, it will announce that he's on the telephone. And then I've got this long bunch of code. Okay, every turn, when the player can see Lucas and the player has not held the printout, say one of these things. So uh, here's the first thing that we'll say. On the next turn, it'll say this. On the next turn, it'll say this. On the next turn, it'll say this. On the next turn, it says that. And then the next turn right there, all that does is avoid printing a, bl a blank line. It's basically you're silencing this character. And then stopping means uh, from now on, only print what's here. This could be something other than run paragraph on if you wanted to say, you know, Lucas keeps working. You could do something like that, but it's not necessary because I've already said Lucas is at the reception desk. So, all right. So let's run that. Let's take a look how that goes and you'll see what I'm talking. Here we are in the lobby. The first time we mention Lucas, he's talking on the telephone. And that's this code. After that, we get Lucas covering the mouthpiece with his hand. I can... Wait. Time passes. Luke listens. I can examine Lucas. And we're slowly working our way through all these various things. And now the stuff that Lucas is saying, talking about the fact that the editorial coverage and the business coverage of a, of a news organization are, you know, different lanes. Uh, you know, that's like a little, you know, germ of truth I want the students to know. And so I'm just kind of putting that in the background channel in the hope that background chatter in the hopes that students who are paying attention to their environment will kind of notice it. Um, uh, if I go east, however, here I am in the business office. Well, the dialogue that I've given Lucas is emphasizing how business and editorial are, should be separate, like church and state. So, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to change that up a little bit. I'm going to have this say that um, I'm going to add a couple things. I'm going to let's see. Um, I'm going to change this so that it is so instead of exits. I'm going to say doors. All right. Uh, now, when I run this game again, this says doors. If I type examine door, it doesn't recognize it. So I'm going actually going to... Uh, uh, the only reason you need to create objects called doors in your game is if you want to do anything unusual. You know, you don't have to, but I mentioned doors. I want there to be idea that like security doors. So I've mentioned the doors. And, uh, you know, having uh, passes to buzz you through doors, it's, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable way of blocking access to other parts of a, of a gaming map. So I'm going to add some doors here in the Gazette News Lobby. Okay. Um, and... Now I'm going to add some code. There we go. So I'm creating, let's just run this and see how this goes. Okay. We've now created the index. There's something new here. Here, see this thing right there? That is a door that's uh, 
in the Gazette lobby in, uh, uh, room, and uh, you know, it's a physical thing that now that I've created a door, I have to call it a door because, you know, for various reasons, Inform 7 needs me to uh, announce that a thing that I'm calling a door is what Inform 7 recognizes as a door. I'm calling it scenery because I'm, it's kind of a background item that I don't want the game to call a whole lot of attention to. But when you run this, now I can take my badge. Um, with this code where it says, instead of opening the door to the business wing, uh, Lucas will warn you, better stay in your lane, and uh, instead of means, okay, well, ordinarily when I go east, by default, the, the computer will just send me into the whatever room is located east. But I put a door in the way, and I've added some code so that here, um, uh, I don't want the, the, um, uh, the game to let me pass through. Uh, now, in, in another, you know, computer uh, game adventure, you know, first person shooter, something like that, there would be somewhere you would, you know, mug a business person, get their ID card and get through the door. Uh, I'm never planning to let the reporter go through this door. Uh, the point is, I'm trying to emphasize, as a reporter, you don't have much to do with the business office. You're, you're not supposed to. So, um, so uh, I'm creating this situation, and because I've mentioned the door to the business wing, someone is going to want to, you know, uh, it's completely not necessary, but because I've created a door that leads from the lobby to the business office, if I want to make the point that the business people are also separated from the news area, I should also then just, you know, follow totally parallel code and say that there's also a door that goes the other way, but I'm not going to, uh, so we just have uh, the door to the business wing is east of the Gazette lobby, it is scenery, it's a door, east of it is the business office. So I've said the this thing called door to the business wing. I basically put it between the uh, Gazette lobby and the business wing. So you have to go through it in order to get there. There are other ways, maybe easier ways of stopping characters from moving from one location to another, but I did want to have the sort of reality of the door uh, so that we can even run this. And now I can take my badge, go east. I can open. I can open that door. Uh, I can, uh, it doesn't let me, but it uh, uh, reacts to that interactivity. I can, okay, there, no problem. Uh, so I, for those players who might want to test, uh, you know, they hear Lucas saying that uh, business and news are like church and state should be separate, and they see two doors, they might try tugging at the doors. And uh, the text here is designed to sort of uh, uh, emphasize and reinforce what Lucas is saying in dialogue. And part of the fun, I think, of any learning through a video game is instead of just listening to something and memorizing it, you do it. Here, I'm physically preventing a character from going into the business wing as a way of emphasizing Lucas's point that these are separate realms. So I kind of want to reward a player who has done everything right up into this point by giving them some in-game feedback. And if they're doing something wrong at this point, before they leave the lobby, I want the sort of friendly character Lucas to give them a, a tip. So let's give Lucas... Uh, Lucas is going to be a little gatekeeper here. Before going south in the Gazette lobby, when the player can see Lucas, if the player has held the printout, Lucas will give you this affirmation. Otherwise, Lucas will say, uh-oh, you better get that printout. So let's run that game. Okay, so let's do everything right. Where's the badge? Got the book. Uh, I take the printout. And I leave. Lucas amicably finger guns me and says, go get him, Tiger. So it's a little affirmation there. 
If, however, I leave the printout, I leave without the printout, Lucas stops you by clearing his throat. The printout in turn, Gruff wanted you to take it. Oh, but whoops. Even though Lucas tells me he stops me, uh, or the game tells me Lucas stops me, I didn't actually stop that action. This before command assumes that after the player, you know, if you are, if you have held that's, you know, you don't have to be holding the printout that, that has held the printout, I could drop the printout and uh, has held the printout will still be true. That's just one of these cool things that Inform 7 actually understands past tenses. Uh, I'm not going to go through teaching all that right now, but that's the reason why this is in past tense. Um, anyway, Lucas gives you this warning uh, here. He gives you the warning if you have not held the printout. If this is true, do this. Else, do that. But after you say this statement, this coding is set up so that the going south on the Gazette lobby action continues, even though Lucas is supposed to be stopping you. I can actually solve that problem pretty easily. Inform 7 has it already set up. I can do instead. The word instead means if the word instead wasn't there, Inform 7 just goes on and does what it's supposed to do. Instead means this thing that follows, do that and then stop. So now that I've delivered this message, I'm saying for this message, I want you to print it out, but then keep doing what you're doing. For this message, I want you to print it out and stop because I don't want you to be able to go south in the Gazette lobby unless this condition is true. So let's take a look at that. So, uh, let's see, take printout. No, I'm going to try leaving without the printout. South, okay. I'm still in the room. I haven't left anywhere. Take the printout. I should read it. Because I have already held it, even though I am not holding it right now, Inform7 is smart enough to give me the positive message and send me out on the street. Okay, so um, Lucas has sent us on, on our way. Uh, we've looked at how to code an environment to navigate. We've looked at some props to manipulate. And we've created some characters that add some emotional context and, you know, help guide the player along. And as you can see, these really aren't discrete things. We had to go back and forth between doing locations and props and characters and circle back several times. Now, um, uh, all these things work together to create a really engaging interactive fiction experience. In the description, there's a link to a slightly expanded version of this game, a playable version of this game, and a link to the source code with some annotations and, uh, uh, you know, take you a, a little bit further along this line. Uh, in the next video, instead of an educational game, I'm going to focus more on a creative expression. I'll be setting up the premise for a noirish kind of detective story where there's no particular educational message. It's just a, you know an atmosphere to experience and, and a story to explore. So um, uh, I hope you're enjoying your exposure to Inform 7. Let me know in the comments uh, what scenario do you think you want to create. Uh, you know, uh, if I can suggest where in the Inform Designer's Manual to look for tips and suggestions and guidelines and even playable demo games, which uh, this uh, uh, amazing documentation has tons and tons and tons of, of you know, sample games and sample uh, activities that um, uh, that allow you to, here, let's go to um, documentation, general index, uh, you know, characters, absolute values, math, Golly, if I go down here to, here's all the things you can put. Remember I had that first time only? Here's all the other things you can put in quoted text. I don't even know half of these. Um, so uh, uh, if I have any coding tips or suggestions for you, I'll be happy to engage with you through the comments. So um, uh, with that being said, I'm going to end this video and I uh, hope you're having a good time.